hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Can we do uh, 7 and 8 if we can? Today we want to uh, we want to cover the plagues, um, the plagues, which will continue from chapter seven all the way to chapter eleven. So, uh, if we can cover from them as many as we can, we want to get a glimpse of what the plagues are about, and we there's certain pattern that we're going to look into, as in every. And, and all the works of God, there is all the certain patterns that he follows. So let's read the stories of the plagues in Egypt. And uh, let us see what we can think of. And I want everybody, every one of us to think about things that has to pertain those, to those plagues. What do they mean uh, in the bigger picture? And what do they mean for us individually? Okay. Uh, let's take it, take, take turns in reading. And Ahid, do you want to start? So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders, in the land of Egypt, but Pharaoh will not heed you so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt mm -hmm. and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Then Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. And Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron 83 years old, when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went in to Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. So the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, as the Lord had said. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning, when he goes out to the water, and you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. And the rod which has, was turned to a serpent, you shall take in your hand. And you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that are in the river shall die. The river shall stink, and the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your rod and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their streams, over their rivers, over their ponds, and over all their pools of water, that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters 
that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. The fish that were in the river died, the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Then the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither was his heart moved by this. So all the Egyptians dug all around the river for water to drink, because they could not drink the water of the river. And seven days passed after the Lord had struck the river. Okay, uh, first few things. <clears> he <throat> starts this chapter by uh, God giving commandment to Moses to be the, the God of Aaron, his brother. And brother would, uh, his brother would be his prophet. So um, there is uh, this relationship. And here, like I said last time, is the, the definition of a prophet. A prophet is not someone who makes miracles or speaks about the future to say a prophecy. Is not is not to speak the future. It doesn't have to be. It actually, can be something about the past. But to define a prophet and a prophecy is basically to speak on behalf of another. Speak on behalf of on behalf of God. So when when Aaron becomes a prophet to Moses, he is speaking on Moses' behalf. So God, uh, Moses gives the staff to Aaron. So Aaron takes the staff from his hand. And make a sign that would belong to Moses. That's number one. Now we have this issue about God hardening the heart. God hardening the heart. So there, there is this questioning about why would God harden the heart of Pharaoh and then punish him? Why would that be? Why, uh, why would God do that? And uh, where is God getting the harden, hardening from? Uh, there is two words in the Hebrew for this. Um, they're used in this chapter. The second one is called uh, chazak. Chazak is a is a something to fasten, to make it strong. They can say you can say uh, somebody's courageous or strong. You don't get scared easily. So. Um, and this more toward the end, when you hear about uh, Pharaoh hardened his heart, the first one is um, in the first few verses of this chapter, it says, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And this is in verse, uh, in verse three. It's uh, kasha or kasha, and that's to make it tough or severe or cruel, so or stiff. So almost like um, his heart is not moved by the signs, and and both of them will lead to the same the same result that uh, Pharaoh will not be enticed to do anything about what he sees. There's something about this that we have to de dig deep deeper into. Like, uh, would, would God give Pharaoh to be obstinate against them and to be defiant and to be um, uh, rejecting God's counsel? What's really meant by hardening the heart? So these, these plagues that's going to start to happen, this is the first one, is the blood. Turning the water into blood. Is a very uh, powerful sign because all the waters in Egypt were turned into blood and the river stank. It's obviously, it's organic material. So we cannot say um, what kind of material it is, but if the Bible says it's blood, then we take it at face value and it's blood and blood is organic material so it's going to decay and if it's coming from animal source then it's going to stink 
So this is a very powerful sign when Pharaoh is going to see all the water turning into blood, he should be shaken. He's not. Okay, so how can we explain that? Any ideas? Why, why God had his heart getting that strong, stiff, severe? What's the point? I mean, God, God, mm -hmm. Go ahead. God has a plan to like show his wonder and glory to his people. And, and I mean, it's like a, the, the Israelites weren't just slaves for that long because, you know, so just so that they could be given up so freely. I mean, they were still slaves and God promised them, I'm going to ease your burdens. I'm going to free you and redeem you. So it's going to happen in a way that's bigger than just asking the first time. And then God is Correct. showing his glory. Ultimately, he's going to show his people his glory. But what does the what what did Pharaoh do to deserve? I'm not, I'm not going to say Pharaoh's doing, but would you think that God would give Pharaoh something wrong to do? Is that something? Um, my question is: Would hardness of heart come from God? If if we think about it as a sin, is it a sin? There is this. Uh, verse from the the psalms that says if you hear his voice today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts is it the same way because god speaks to moses speaks to Pharaoh through moses and tell him let the people go and if you don't we're gonna do this and this and this so the way uh, uh, moses said um what did they say to Pharaoh? And uh, they went in there and showed him the, the sign. He told them to go in and take the staff and yeah. So he said in verse 2, he said, Thou shalt speak, you shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall speak to Pharaoh. So God's going to speak to Moses. Moses is going to speak to Aaron. Aaron's going to speak to Pharaoh. There's like a, a, three, a three communication channels God to Moses, Moses to, to Aaron, Aaron to Pharaoh, between four persons. So uh, uh, he said that then at the beginning, you shall speak all that I command you. So God is going to command Moses. And Aaron, your brother, shall speak to Pharaoh. That he send the children of Israel out of his land. And the, the plan A was for three days. But he said, I will uh, harden his heart. So multiply my signs. So what is hardening here? I believe... So there's a difference between if you hear his voice today, do not harden your heart, and this one. This one comes with threatening. This comes toward somebody who posed themselves as an enemy to God. That uh, they don't want to listen. Not because uh, they are lazy or... No, they are enemies. Pharaoh here is an enemy. So when 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 they are when when the enemy is threatened, the normal response is the person would be scared. They will be scared, and so their decisions to to listen will be out of fear. Do you think that's what God wants? Do you think God is into scaring anybody into obedience? He's going to do that with his children, though. Well, he does do... say to fear him. Huh? I mean, he does say to fear him, which is kind of like, right, it's supposed to be like the way you're a child and you fear your parents, so you do the right thing. Right, but do you think this is going to happen with, with an enemy? No. That's not noble. 
you scare your enemy into sub, sub, subjection. It's very, it's very tyrannic. It's almost like the em, emperors of old. When you get like your empire, the imperial army besieging, besieged, besieging a, a city, when you um, uh, want to conquer it and show your force and melt the hearts of the soldiers at the walls, they would open the wall and receive you. So do you think God would do that? No. no. So I believe what's hardening here with me is to, to make him courageous. To make him courageous. So he doesn't get scared. And it can lead to obstinance if they choose. So in a way, I'm going to give you the chance to make a choice, but not be afraid. Now, that choice has to come from uh, your, your mind and not out of a fearful heart. So that you should be convinced, not scared. I believe that's the, the case here because the two words used in this chapter might be taken to mean courageous or strong or well well anchored. So that Pharaoh will be well anchored, taking decisions not based on fear, but based on his free will. Because with fear, there's no free will. So if they, they suffer, it will not be out of God kind of oppressive force. It will be totally Pharaoh's choice. Does that make sense? Well, you could say, like, why did God have to do things that were so scary? <laughs> but they, this happened? this did not touch Pharaoh's heart. He didn't really get scared. Yeah. To the last minute, he made one choice after another. To the last minute, he made choices with complete freedom and courageously, you can say, but stupidly courageously. But if God is giving him the courage to face it, then I guess why God gives him the courage to face it so that God can do these signs that are, I mean, not so that he can do, but God is doing these signs that are, would be terrifying, but he gives Pharaoh the heart to be able to handle it. I don't, I don't think he's just, he just kind of supported him so he doesn't get scared. So uh, let us say, uh, for two reasons, of course. The first reason is um, that Pharaoh will make a free will choice. So he sees with his eyes what's happening in Egypt, and he is responsible as a king. And he, he, he perceived there's very dramatic things that's going to happen that's going to hurt his people. But yet, as, as a you know, when you have a king going into a war, if the king is a faithful king and a good king, if they find, if he finds that this war would make his people suffer more, um, then he would say, no, I don't want to go into this war. Just take whatever you want and leave. But if the king is arrogant and proud and is not afraid, he would suffer any loss just to, to win the, the war. And it seems like in all the movies and all the stories, it shows you Pharaoh as an arrogant person who is not easily persuaded by fear. The arrogance is his. The, the courage is God's. So God is choosing to give him a little courage because if God had done these signs... Pharaoh is so hard-headed and arrogant that if yeah. God did these signs, he would just be scared into submission. Exactly. But the Lord wants him to not be scared into submission, but he's giving him a little courage because he knows he's arrogant to be exactly. able to handle the signs, but also... Like, I, I, yeah, that's why the fathers of the church kind of compared Pharaoh to Satan. When Jesus came to the world, Satan challenged him and he wanted to take him down to kill him. And the, so the father said, okay, he's yours, take him. And why would the, would the father allow Satan to, um, to conspire to kill his son? 
to to get this 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 guts in him. It's gutsy for the for the devil to kill the son of God. The devil was given that, was given the chance to do it, but not knowing at the end of it, who's going to lose everything. Pharaoh thought at the end of it he will have the slaves forever, and he will um, challenge their pride and subdue their uh, arrogance to ask him to go out and all that stuff. But at the end of it, Pharaoh lost everything, lost even his army. So this is one of the, the characters. Actually, the Pharaoh is one of the antichrists in the Bible. That's a big list starting from Cain all the way to uh, the last antichrist, which will be at the end of times. Okay. Uh, so the first the first sign, here's, here's something about the first sign. If, if anyone wants to interrupt and say a thought or something, the first sign has something to say to us in the New Testament. Anyone? The first sign is what? Turning water into blood. That was the first sign by which there will be an exodus. There will be a, a bringing of freedom. The service of Moses is going to bring the people out of, the, of Egypt and put them on the, on the way to the promised land. Is there any hint like that in the New Testament? A very sign that leads us out of the slavery into the freedom of the children of God. Well, there's the first sign where the Lord turns the water into wine at the wedding. Correct. Same thing. There's a turning of water into something red. And this time it's not uh, to blood, it's to wine in a wedding feast. And when St. Mary, this is the hint that St. John is giving, said, we have no wine. What did he say? My hour has not yet come. And uh, the hour that St. John speaks about it is the hour of the cross. So this is the beginning, as if he's saying to her, we don't need to start now. I can linger a little bit. We need to prepare more or something like that. But then he yielded and he began. He began his course of miracles that will lead him to the cross. Miracles specifically in St. John is the subject of the envy of the Pharisees and the leaders for the miracles. They will put him to death, especially the, the one last miracle before his cross is the raising of Lazarus. In the Gospel of St. John, there are eight miracles. Like you see here in the book of Exodus, there's ten plagues. The last of them is the one that would free the people out. In the Gospel of St. John, there's eight. Eight miracles. Anybody can count them with me? So the first one is the turning water into wine, chapter 2 of St. John. What's the next one? The specific miracles that he... St. John speaks of many miracles, but the ones that he specifically mentioned by details. In chapter three and four, there was the son of the the son of the leader, the son of the centurion. That's number two. Number three is the paralytic by the poor in chapter five. Number six is the, the breaking of the bread into and feeding the multitude, 5,000. Are we counting six or five? I think that was four. Five, chapter six, right? So we have uh, the uh, wedding of Cana. That's the first one. You have the son of the centurion. And you have the... Um, what is this? Really? The paralytic by the pool and four, I'm sorry. The multiplying of the bread, number four. Count with me the walking on water in chapter six again. And count it or not count it, we'll see. Number, that's five of them. Uh, number six is the man born blind in chapter 11. 
number seven is the raising of Lazarus. Number eight is? The catching of a hmm? fish. No, there's, there's no fish in the St. John. Number eight is the resurrection. Oh, there it is. His own resurrection. So those are the eight miracles in St. John Gospel. But it starts, this series of miracles starts by the wedding at Cana and ends up by his own resurrection. So it is almost like a new exodus that Jesus is going to bring us into a new existence, a new life, the newness of life that St. Paul talks about. But before he does this, he has to start a series of miracles. And instead of plagues, we have miracles that brings life and healing and resurrection at the end of it. So that he, there's this idea, St. John is saying, if the Old Testament brought death and sickness, because the plagues in Egypt were very devastating, all of them, the New Testament has miracles that will bring life and healing. And that's what the plagues can tell us that your, our, our salvation, our exodus from here will happen through grace that shows miracles, that shows good things through the New Testament. Any other thoughts? Let's go into chapter 8. Danny, you want to read? And the Lord spoke to Moses, uh, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go and they, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly which shall go up and come into your house, into your bedroom, on your bed, on into the houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens, and into your kneading bowls. And the frogs shall come on you, come up on you, on your people, and on all your servants. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with, with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought out, and brought out frogs on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, accept the honor of saying, when I, sh when I shall intercede for you and for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from you and for your houses, that they may remain in the river only. So he said, tomorrow, and he said, let it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from you, from your houses, and from your servants and from your people they shall remain in the river only. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. So the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of their houses, died out of the houses, out of the, court, the courtyards, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together in heaps and land sat, in land stack, in the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them. And as the Lord had said, so the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the, the land and that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. <clears throat> and they did so for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth. And it became lice on man and beast, and all the dust on the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there, so there were lice on man and beast. And the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. 
And the Lord said to Moses, rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out of the water. Then say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Or else if you will not let my people go, behold, I will, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants, on your people and into your houses. And the houses of Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. And in, the, and in that day, I will set apart the gland of Goshen and in, my, and in which my people dwell, that no, one, no, that no swarms of flies shall be there in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall be. And the Lord did so. Thick swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh and to the, into his house into his servants' houses, and into, the, and into all the land of Egypt, and the land was corrupted because of the swarms of flies. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God in, in the land. And Moses said, It is not right to do so, for we would be sacrificing the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. If we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, then they will not then will they not stone us? We will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he will command us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go so that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far away, intercede for me. Then Moses said, indeed, I am going out from you and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh from his servants and his people. But let Pharaoh not deal deceitfully anymore in letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and entre entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh and from his servants and from his people. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Neither would he let the people go. Okay. Uh, they say uh, that the commentators from the Jewish teachers, they say there you can divide the nine plagues into three triads, three sets of three. And there is a certain pattern. Um, so um, the first two plagues of each triad are preceded by warnings to Pharaoh while the third is not. Before the first plague in each group, God sends Moses to, Moses to Pharaoh in the morning saying, station yourself before Pharaoh. And before the second plague, he says, go to Pharaoh without specifying the time of the day. All the plagues in the first triad are brought on by an action of Aaron. In the second triad, the first two are brought about directly by God and the third by Moses. In the third triad, all are brought on by an action of Moses. These nine plagues resemble calamities known within nature. People are aware of them. Um, but the reason why they are God's actions, because they happen very quickly, one after another, and they come on command. Um, there is something about the third plague, which is called lice, but it's actually... Otherwise, elsewhere it's called gnats, something that bites. Um, this one and this one, and it started from the third one. Pharaoh realized that his magicians could not end the plague. They only could make it worse. So um, at one point he calls Moses and said, he pleads, ask God on my behalf that this would stop. This is a humbling of Pharaoh. Because he found that his his magicians cannot improve things, and for true, the first two plagues, the magicians did exactly the same. They could turn water into blood. They could uh, bring flaw frogs from the river, but the third one, it's for some reason, is uh, they were unable, and they said to him, "This is the finger of God." What did Moses take? Take dust from the furnace, and he blew it in the wind. And then you have a swarms, swarms of lice or gnats covering everywhere. And many commentators said this is an act of creation that happened from the dust. 
Um, okay. The magicians usually talk to Pharaoh about that this is an act of magic. They could do it. They could do it themselves. Um, in one of the plagues, Moses asked Pharaoh to, to specify the time so that he knows it is on command that God actually is the one who do it. The the gnats or the lice, it's uh, vermin. It refers to a very small insect. So, such as mosquitoes or lice, that's why it's translated either. They are in, unable to duplicate that one. What do you mean that these are? Um, what do you mean that these are things that happen like naturally, like like scientists? No, from time to time there is a, yeah something like it's not not out of the uh, experience of the Egyptians. So they might have a swarm of uh, locusts come and destroy their crops or have hail come down and destroy many things. Or at one another time, they might have an infestation of lice or yeah. mosquitoes. Yeah. When certain times when there's a flood and the, sometimes you get like a lot of uh, insects with the flood because of mm -hmm. the amount of water, swarms of insects. Um, so so Pharaoh's not scared by this because there is not and then but but at the same time Moses is telling him this is very special because you, we will specify when it's going to happen and it happens on command and he's getting a warning some of them getting a warning mm -hmm. okay uh, last chapter nine I'm gonna stop there Karen. Then the Lord said to Moses, go in to Pharaoh and tell him, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the oxen, on the sheep, a very severe pestilence. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Then the Lord appointed a set time saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So the Lord did this thing on the next day and all the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. Then Pharaoh sent and indeed not even one of the livestock of the Israels was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard. He did not let go of the people. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take for yourself handfuls of ashes from a furnace and let Moses scatter it toward the heavens inside of Pharaoh. And it will become fine dust in all the land of Egypt. And it will cause boils that break out and sores on land and beasts are all the lands of Egypt. Then they took ashes from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh and Moses scattered them towards heaven. And they caused boils that break out in the sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils for the boils were on the magicians and all of the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and he did not heed them just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, thus is the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For at this time, I will send all my plague to your very heart and on your servants and on your people, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Now, if I stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have known then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed for this purpose, I raised you up, that I may show power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. As yet you exalt yourself against my people, and now you will not let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause heavy hail to rain down, such as has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. 
Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field. For the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is not found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. He who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, and on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder in him, and fire darted to the ground, and the Lord ran hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, so very heavy that there was none like in all the land of Egypt, since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout the land of Egypt. All that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen were the children of Israel where there was no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time, the Lord is righteous, and my people are not here with you. Entreat the Lord that they that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it is enough. I will let you go and you shall say no longer. So Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease and there will be no more hail. That you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you will not break. I know that you will not yet fear the Lord God. Now the flax and the barley were struck, for the barley was in the head, and the flax was in butt. But the wheat and spell were not struck, for they are like crops. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread his hands out to the Lord. Then the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured onto the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, he sinned the other one. And he hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard, neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord has spoken by Moses. Uh, one scene from this is the spreading of the hands that Moses actually goes out and spread his hand. This is a beautiful scene where uh, it shows you the powerful of a prayer uh, with a spread of hands. Later, that spread of hands is a gesture is going to be shown uh, by the psalmist and the kings, the righteous kings and the prophets and all the people of God. The first one to actually spread his hands before God was Leah, the mother of uh, six of the children of, of Jacob. Leah, when she spread her hand and when she begot Judah, we talked about this, she said she threw her hand out and uh, towards heaven lifted his fa her face and said, I praise the Lord, and that's the name Judah. I, I thank the Lord or praise the Lord. So here, Moses is taking an um, intercessory stand before God, spreading his hands before God. This is a beautiful scene. It's a picture you look at in, in your mind and imitate. Now we stand and spread our hands before God in the time of need. And especially here, he's interceding for his enemies. He's lifting up his hands to God and God's going to listen to him. He uh, spread his hands before God and God listened. Immediately, the rain stopped and the hail stopped. Um, but unfortunately, Rafael does not appreciate things like this. He continues to have that uh, hardness of heart. Uh, we should stop here. It's uh, five months past the 30. And we should prepare for chapter 10, 11, and 12 for next time. And I want to take them slowly, especially 11 and 12. So uh, we'll do chapter 10 next time, and then we'll go to 11 and 12. Okay. Let's say our Father. And in the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, make us worthy, your Lord, say thank thee. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. May the love of God the Father and grace is only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Peace be with you. Good night, everyone.